This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, you're stuck with me as the speaker today, um, Bob Taylor. And uh, what I'm going to talk about um, is basically a thinly veiled uh, construct to talk about some uh, basic and translational research in the last half. Um, I'll talk about a story that we've been involved with for about seven or eight years now um, with some collaborators at Berkeley and here at Emory. Uh, trying to figure out a good way to basically detect infected medical devices. And I've sort of put it in the context of defibrillators and pacemakers here, but you could easily insert hip or spinal rod or, uh, you know, chronic uh, line or whatever. And I think all, all of you know, infected, you know, we put in these foreign bodies, and foreign bodies are a great locus uh, for infection. And while our overall our numbers are pretty good, particularly in cardiology and in implanted electronic devices that are very good compared to other medical devices. You know, some these remain really complicated patients in times with very difficult decisions. And so this story started out um, in collaboration with a friend of mine, Noreen Murthy, who used to be here at uh, Georgia Tech and now is at Berkeley. And it started out as sort of a brainstorming session, um, re really inspired by a patient of mine who had a uh, uh, an apparent infected uh, pacemaker and when we basically took it all out it wasn't infected at all and but of course the new one we put in got infected and and she had a terrible course and and it sort of stimulated me to think about this a little bit and collaborate with Noreen. It's also a story of uh, uh, for those of you in the basic science world of sort of sticking with it. Um, as I'll show you in a minute this works funded by several grants but the uh, you know, sort of the main grant is an NIH R01 sort of a, uh, that's a pretty large grant that funded a lot of the fundamental technology. And everyone thinks you write a grant and get it accepted. We actually submitted this grant five times before it got funded. Uh, we submitted it once to, uh, to a group and sort of focused on endocarditis and cardiac devices. And, and the response was, you know, endocarditis really isn't that big a problem. We have the Duke criteria, so, you know, and implantable devices rarely get infected, so there's not a real problem here. And that, that grant got triaged. And so we resubmitted to another section, got a good score, and then we, not good enough, and then we resubmitted, almost got funded, but didn't, and then went back to that study section, got a worse score. And eventually, you know, three and a half years later, uh, it was funded. So. It's a, it's a lesson in sort of sticking with things. So here are my disclosures, and those are important. So I, I, am, uh, I do have an equity interest in a company that I helped found called Microbial Medical. If you have about $1.25, you can have 50% of the interest in the company right now. Um, uh, but the work is supported by NIHR01s and SBIR, and then money from the GRA, uh, which is our, we're very been fortunate to have here in Georgia. Uh, we had phase one and phase two funding from them. And then I also um, have uh, among several of the patents related to this maltodextrins. All right, so let's talk about cardiac implantable electronic devices. So there is no surprise to anyone, especially all the EP guys sitting in the back of the room, that the number of devices has gone up dramatically, and they're very thankful for that, as is John Crane, our business manager, that the number of these devices used in the U.S. have grown spectacularly. And this is somewhat older data because this not well, these data are not well uh, kept, and there's sort of a several-year lag until they come out. But you can certainly see that overall, uh, in the red line there, massive increase in devices, a lot of it driven by ICDs and, of course, with um, CRT as well, driving all of that over the, over the years. Driven by technology, driven by older patient population, or overall population, the graying of our population, a lot of age-related disease going up. What's really interesting, though, is you look at that same data set, you look at the number of infections, and this is the rate of infection. So at very low nationally, the numbers are around 1%, and perhaps even a little bit lower than that in some of the more recent studies. And again, it pretends on your criteria, which we'll get into a little bit for calling these infections. But this data set showed in about 2004, there was a big bump, and you know, from 1.5 to a little under 2.5% nationally. Certainly at many centers, those numbers are lower than that. Uh, but it was a really interesting trend. So what happened? Why are we having more infections? Um, and is it just a, 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 an outlying bit of data? 
Here's from a, another data set using a hospital-based data to pull it out. That last was uh, CMS data, pulling from hospital, but looking at it, and this is all normalized, so one is your starting ratio, and so the blue line there is the total, I'm sorry, the labels didn't come through. This is a total uh, device implantations, and there's been a steady increase in device implantations over this 10-year uh, period, but the infection rate has gone up, grown out of proportion. So again, showing increased infections during a time of increasing device use, but the increasing rate of infection is growing out, out of proportion. So what, why is this happening? Well, is it operator experience? We've known that, that as you, um, a lot of EP services are becoming much more of a commodity, right? Started mainly at tertiary referral centers like this and now more broadly distributed. Is it because we have more operators that are perhaps less experienced? And, and if you look overall, that's probably not true because the overall complication rates, hematoma, things like that, those really actually have gone down with a, as things have gotten better and with the better devices, better technique, better uh, uh, work through the organizations, uh, EP organizations, et cetera. But is it changes in the comorbid factors? And again, as our indications for these have broadened, we've taken on sicker patients. And this is from a, uh, a group, this is again that first set of data that showed the bump, uh, that 2004. And what's really interesting here, if you look at the characteristics of the patients getting implantable devices, well sure enough, heart failure, we expected that one to go up, you know, as we again had broader use for ICDs and CRT. But if you look at other things, here's in the green line here, that's diabetes, and this is renal failure in patients with renal impairment. As we'll talk about later, that's a pretty strong factor for, um, <clears throat> for uh, uh, infection. And also interesting, respiratory disease has gone up. And again, that's probably related to colonization of the face and things like that with some bacteria. So again, our patients are getting sicker, and that's an important uh, re reason for this increase in comorbid uh, infections probably. And then the other thing is the devices are more complicated. You got more nooks and crannies on them, they're bigger, they have more leads, et cetera, and that certainly has been linked to a higher rate of infection. So the more leads you put in, <clears throat> the greater the risk, and the more complicated the device, the longer the procedure time, things like that seem to factor in in sort of a synergistic way. While some of those individual factors, I'll show you in a minute, fall out, probably the combined effect uh, adds to that. Um, and I do want to add, um, we have a lot of EP folks in the room, correct me on anything I say. I'm not pretending to be an EP person. I was telling Mike Lloyd before the conference that I've actually never put in a device, unlike most of our fellows. When I did my fellowship, they were doing the very first, shows how old I am, the very first ICDs, and those were all done in the OR and the belly with the open chest and all that kind of stuff. So feel free to jump in and correct me. Again, as I told you, just trying to warm you up to some basic science and translation. Longitudinally, you know, and this is this is a lot of this work comes from Mayo, and so this is from Old State County, looking at a, a large cohort. This is several thousand patients over a long period of time in Olmstead County, those that had devices, and look at their relative risk of developing either a bloodstream infection here on the left or a, a confirmed device infection. And again, bloodstream infection is going to be a little bit of a, a less precise way of looking at this. Um, because basically that's going to tell you about anything, urosepsis, any of that kind of stuff would turn up positive there. But it just shows you this group over time will develop positive blood cultures basically. And that over a period of years that, you know, maybe up to 15 or 20 percent of these patients will have a positive blood culture. So as we're putting in these devices and they're staying in patients for long periods of time, they're going to have positive blood cultures. And whether those are from the device or from some other infection, that's, that's for uh, obviously likely multifactorial. But if you look at actual device infections, you know, sure enough, in this long time follow-up, permanent pacemaker is very low, ICDs, and this is one of the studies showing that more complex devices, ICDs, are more likely to eventually have an infection. Now, the number of patients out here at the longer time point is a little bit lower, so this is a little more uh, variability around this last endpoint, and I wouldn't put to my hat on, put, put, hang my hat on that too tightly there, that actual number, but it does show that there's a trend with time. And that this isn't an acute event, you don't get an infection within the first 30 days and then you're protected and you're clear. And this is true for all medical devices. You could just, just as easily ins insert hip replacement or knee replacement here. Someone has a knee replacement, that's fine, or a hip replacement, they do great, but they're still at risk for late infections. So what's the cost? You know, so, you know, I was asking 
um, some of the fellows the other day said, well, a primitive pacer is like 25 k and an ICD is like $50,000. So that's, that's sort of what the cost would be if someone had to have a device replaced because of an infection. But in fact, the cost of managing infection is much higher. And here's some old data, again, from 2008, um, showing that just this escalating cost of managing these infections. And any of you taking care of these patients realize you can really get into some challenging situations, especially those that are pacemaker dependent, and also with recurrence of infections. And uh, sometimes you have a secondary site that seeds, et cetera. And so these numbers are up to $140,000 in 2008. You know, in 2017 dollars, that's, that's probably over a quarter of a million dollars with the increase in healthcare costs that have occurred over that period of time. So <clears throat> the, the cost of an infected device, incredibly expensive. You get into things like hips and knees, then that cost goes up even more because those become even more expensive um, because of uh, long-term care for some of those patients and other out-of-hospital expenses. So this is a little surprising when you think about it. You know, what's the clinical presentation of a patient with an infected uh, implantable electronic device? And we always think of, well, someone's got a fever, and then, you know, the surface is going to be red, and they're going to have an elevated white count. But this is, um, you know, a look at, uh, you know, a pretty large sample of patients, 200 patients who presented with a, and they use TDI, but a cardiac device infection, but anyhow, and they mean pacemakers and ICDs. But you can look at the percentages there, and in fact, you know, about half of them don't have a fever. You know, a lot of them don't have chills, so a lot of them don't really have a lot of constitutional signs. But, you know, how do you make the diagnosis, right? And then even local findings, only about 70% in this group actually had erythema at the device and at the surface, but obviously you can have infection internally. And again, as Mike Lloyd and I were talking about before, you know, with the new implantable small electronic devices that don't have an external generator, obviously you wouldn't have any of these local findings here at the site. Um, you know, leukocytosis, about half the cases. And it really is, a, you know, a challenge sometimes diagnosing, right? You don't really know whether the person has this device. And that was sort of, again, one of the things that motivated me the most when I first started was this, this young woman I took care of who we were all convinced, you know, she had a bunch of stuff. She had an elevated sed rate, she had fever, she had tenderness of sight. Actually, it wasn't infected. And I think we've all made the, the mistake the other way where someone's had a pretty benign looking sight, had some elevated, um, had some positive cultures, and sure enough, turned out to have an infection at the lead site. And I think that's the challenge is you have both sort of a, you can have a very larger infection involving the surface, involving the pocket, but you can also have small infections involving at the actual site of implantation, which leads to a very very varied uh, clinical presentation. And it can be really challenging. The other interesting thing is when do the infections occur? And, you know, I think a lot of us think, oh, well, most of it's surgical site infection. It occurs right after you know, people didn't wash their hands, whatever, you know. The things weren't quite clear, technique wasn't perfect, but in fact, only about a quarter of the infections occur in the first month. The CDC definition of a surgical site infection is within a year, so if you put that together, you know, you've got about half or 60%, but you still got 40% of these infections occurring more than a year out. And that's obviously because you're getting seeding of these devices from some other source, presumably, or some other site uh, within the body. Um, sometimes that's related to late breakdown. And, and again, I just talking about a patient we saw at the VA a couple of years ago, had a device in for three years, and it, for a variety of reasons, it eroded through the skin. Obviously, he got infection of that at a late point from, a, from an erosion event. So that's also possible. <clears throat> and I think we all know the staph is the main organism most of the time, coag negative staph, um, about 40% of the time, meth sensitive staph. Uh, uh, another quarter, and then gram negatives are really relatively rare. Um, in later infections, they become more common. Uh, you know, in fungal infections, thankfully, very rare as well. Um, so we're thinking, you know, gram positives most of the time, and thinking staph uh, most of the time. Uh, but you can get some really interesting bacteria and some very unusual bacteria, particularly with later infections. And then, just to show that it's not just not us, this is. Uh, this was just a more recent thing from a, a look in China where they looked at 220 patients with confirmed infections. And again, their result, their criteria were a little different in that you could have negative culture results um, from the pocket itself. They could have positive uh, bacteremia. But again, showing coag negative staph being a huge uh, component of it and staph being the, the major bacteria to think about. And very unusual, uh, much more unusual, much, more, much less common to have gram negatives. <clears throat> 
So what are the risk factors? Um, so this was a result of a meta-analysis. Meta so there have been about 15 or 20 papers that looked at risk factors responsible for uh, device infection. <clears throat> and so this was a meta-analysis tried to put together all those papers. And it puts together a lot of the common suspects that you would immediately leap to, leap to mind. So end-stage renal disease, obviously a huge odds ratio. Um, and those patients we struggle with uh, putting in these devices and usually they try to put them in when absolutely necessary. Um, uh, you know, you can see procedure duration came out there with very large confidence intervals. That's because that was defined very vaguely and very differently among those uh, 15 to 20 studies. Um, but, you know, steroid use, renal insufficiency, that means less mild, you know, not on dialysis, etc. History of malignancy, diabetes jumps up there. That's no surprise. Diabetics are suspect more susceptible to almost every infection and almost every surgical or non-surgical procedure. Heart failure and oral anticoagulant use, and the latter probably linked to hematoma, as we'll talk about in a minute. So a lot of the usual suspects, and you know, with kidney disease really ranking up there very high with the end-stage renal disease patients, presumably because they're bacteremic uh, intermittently uh, during dialysis, and that's a, a source of uh, bacteria for secondary uh, infection. The procedural risk factors, and I made these red and green because they go in different directions. Hematoma, I think we all know when you have a hematoma, you're at increased risk in any sort of lead problem. Um, anybody that's still doing abdominal sites has got to increase. If you had a previous temporary pacer, and then if you're undergoing a revision or device change, that increases your risk. So anytime you go back into the pocket. Again, those are no surprises and, and known to all of you. The, the other thing at the bottom there is anti antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, was a favorable odds ratio for reducing this and obviously doesn't eliminate it <clears throat> and uh, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a few seconds. So one of the questions is is well maybe these things just have bacteria all the time and with our we have some very sensitive ways for looking at bacteria now right so you can take a device and you know swab the surface and do PCR on it and look for bacterial genes, in this case 16S ribosomal DNA. So that would tell you that there's bacteria there. And so this is a, a small study that's been repeated and several, you know, several others have done very similar things with this and all shown pretty much the same results. So that if you take patients that are just coming in for a regular generator exchange, perfectly feeling fine, no white count, no indication of any infection, and you scrub the surface of the device when you take it out, uh, and you do either cultures or look for PCR to look for the DNA suggestive bacteria is that you have positive results. And so they found in this small group of about, you know, 44, pa uh, 40, they had overall 44 patients out of a group of, uh, uh, um, this is wrong, this is actually several hundred, several hundred patients. They had 44 patients that were positive. They had 44 patients with 37% positive, I'll get it right now. And, uh, most of those were by uh, uh, PCR, showing that you had at least DNA from bacteria on there. That doesn't mean there's living bacteria, but they also grew cultures were positive in some of those patients. Um, so it really raises the possibility that you have bacteria there all the time. And that's also the issue of biofilms. So we talk about biofilms, that you can get a bacterial by a, a subclinical infection on the device and the bacteria stay in a relatively dormant state in that biofilm so they're not very metabolically active but they're there and under the right circumstances uh, can cause problems um, and uh, and this is just a breakdown of the culture of what of what they got and they got you know the usual suspects mostly staff right they got you know 13 of them uh, about 50 60 percent of them were staff Again, these are asymptomatic patients. So suggesting the bacteria are there, um, you know, you can debate whether the PCR is very helpful to you because, again, it could tell you about dead bacteria. Um, because DNA will hang around for a long time. But uh, it does raise that concern that we have sort of chronically uh, low levels of bacteria on, on devices. Um, and th this is another study uh, sort of doing the same thing just to show you this was... Uh, a straight culture study that was done in 2010 on explanted devices. Again, 122 asymptomatic patients, basically a third of them had something turn up on culture. A lot of it staph epi, uh, you know, uh, that shows up. Um, could that have been contamination during the, during the explant? Obviously, that's a possibility, uh, but it does, it does uh, make, you th make you think about that and whether you're constantly fighting sort of chronic infection all the time in these devices.
So antibiotic prophylaxis, you know, how, how great is that? Does that really work? And it's sort of standard care at, at all institutions now to provide that. That comes from the surgical literature where, you know, that's been well known for decades, came out of the abdominal uh, surgical literature where people study that. And the goal is really to prevent those surgical site infections. So those, those infections occur in the first year, heavily staff, almost exclusively staff infections. And if you put that all together, that's only about 60% of the infection. So even antibiotic prophylaxis, which is sort of our gold standard, absolutely necessary, done religiously, it's, it's, it's not impacting almost half of the infections. And there are some contrary data in certain patients to suggest it doesn't work, but that's the standard of care. Uh, but current recommendations are for a beta-lactam agent within one hour at the start of surgery, certain special patients, dialysis, et cetera, you broaden that coverage uh, significantly or other issues. Uh, but those are the recommendations. And, and that's the, honestly, the only well-defined sort of intervention that's been shown to prevent these infections. And here's, here's a, again, another meta-analysis looking at, a, at a, a, a larger set of about six or seven studies here, you know, a fair number of patients, as you can see. But again, the odds ratio here, or the risk ratio here, about 0.13 with very tight confidence intervals favoring the use of ana using of uh, uh, preoperative, PSA means preoperative antibiotics, uh, as well as a strong antiseptic technique, obviously. So uh, showing strong benefit of that. And that's really, really the most solid data that are out there on this subject. Now, there's some other cool things out there. I think you guys have seen some of this device envelopes for preventing infection. So these antibiotic uh, coated um, uh, uh, sort of mesh uh, things for s slow release of antibiotic. Um, it's really hard and to slowly release an antibiotic over a long period of time. Keep in mind that's not going to be drifting out over a year or two years or anything like that. It's going to be days, days to weeks probably, where you get effective local levels. But um, and then one of the first studies uh, looked at, or one of the more larger earlier studies looked at this 2014, and this was not a prospective study. It was they flipped over and started doing it on all patients and looked at the freedom from six-month infection and looked at uh, in the, what they called the envelope era and the pre-envelope era, but showed a significant improvement in a, in a large number of patients. So that was great. This is the pretty expensive technology. It adds a lot of expense to it. And so um, the prospective study out of uh, Vanderbilt, I think, was more helpful, included patients with high-risk characteristics in a prospective study, so about 900 patients, and they had uh, defined the renal failure. The usual those things sort of that came up on the previous, so renal failure, diabetes, heart failure, reimplantation, et cetera. And of the controls who didn't receive the envelope, they got about 19 infections. The antibiotic, they got one infection. And I think the odds ratios there were very strong, favoring the use of an antibiotic envelope, but again, targeting the high-risk group to make use of a, a fairly expensive addition uh, to the surgical cost. And uh, what was interesting is of those 19 control patients for this, uh, basically eventually died of infections related to their implantable devices. So, um, so that, that's an interesting approach and, and one that uh, I know others here use, and, and particularly in patients that are at high risk. Um, next couple seconds, we'll finish up here on the sort of clinical part of it and talk about, you know, so these are the current guidelines, and um, I, there must be another set of guidelines about to do out. These are the most recent in 10 um, I guess about every seven or eight years they come out, but it's really, if you look at all of the AHA guidelines, this is one of the ones where this is a lot of this is expert opinion without objective data driving a lot of it. And so I think all of you know that if the superficial infection, sure enough, you can give some topical, you can give some oral antibiotics for a few weeks and see if that clears up, but if there's any sign of a pocket infection or, 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 or bacteremia, all the hardware comes out. And this is the management protocol after, as recommended, after the device is removed, you know, withdrawing blood cultures and positive blood cultures to TE and look for signs of infection. And those dictate the duration of antibiotic treatment. Obviously, very challenging in patients who are pacemaker dependent. And, and then additional guidelines for reimplantation. And again, sort of all the obvious stuff that you would think about those that have positive blood cultures and a positive TE, so you have. Uh, either vegetations on a valve or on the, on the hardware, on the leads, and the blood cultures remain, uh, or you have to wait until the blood cultures are negative, but you have to treat even longer uh, when you have valve vegetations. No, no surprise there at all. And again, most of that is expert opinion, very, very little of that validated.
and long term things. And, and so I've talked about uh, implantable electronic devices. Just think about the other things. One of Andy Smith's favorite things, LVADs, who uh, developed their infection rate. Andy might say this is a low estimate. Um, uh, one of my friends who's a heart failure transplant person said he had a, had a, he, he, uh, he once told, he was once told by one of his mentors that when you implant an LVAD, it's sort of like when you put a skylight in your, in your house. The skylight, if it's not leaking now, it will eventually leak at some point. If you put an LVAD in, if it's not infected now, it will eventually get infected at some point. So there's a huge problem with those, and that's because of the external port. And hopefully with newer technologies eliminating that external port, we can move away from that. But, you know, even patients with balloon pumps have, have infection rates and, excuse me, and hemodialysis grafts is another problem. Now, while the rate is much lower here, the number of these is actually huge, right? So that's a, numerically, this becomes a much bigger problem. So we have lots of problems. And then beyond cardiology, uh, hip and knee, infect, knee implants, uh, again, much, much larger problem. Huge number of orthopedic implants. Um, and even though the rates can be very low, as low as it, uh, for knee, I think the national number is around 2%, um, given the number of artificial uh, knees put in, that, that's a huge number of patients. So, so this moves on to sort of the more researchy part. So, so that leaves us with a gap in our knowledge, you know, and the question we always, is it really infected? And the in question is often not only when the patient first presents, because sometimes there you definitely know, but as you can see from those guidelines, are they infected after you've finished your treatment? After you've treated through this, you've taken the device out and you've cleaned everything out, and you've given your 72 or four weeks of antibiotics, is it you know, are they really clean? Is it are the is the infection totally cleared up? And can you go? Can you then go ahead and put a new heart, bit of hardware in? And so this is where we got into: Can we develop better ways to detect infections uh, associated with medical devices? And again, I frame this in the context of of defibrillators and things like that. But it's really a much broader question uh, with almost everything that we put in patients. They can get infected. And so this is the warning. So this is basic science time here, all right? So just, just be careful, stay with me for a few slides here, and then we'll get back to some more translational things. So I'm gonna to talk to you about maltodextrins. So um, uh, maltodextrins are these polysaccharides. So they're glucose molecules stuck together, and usually three to about 17 or 18 glucoses stuck together. And um, it says they're common food additive. So it's in Ensure, for example. Um, it's sort of a synthetic food additive, if you will. If you go online, you'll see all sorts of, you know, nasty things about how this is killing the world, you know, to have uh, maltodextrins out there. Because it's a way of giving you very high calories in a, in a very uh, concentrated way. Now, we eat maltodextrins, and we, in our GI tract, we break those down into simple glucose, and we absorb the glucose. That's fine. But we don't have a way, mammalian cells don't have a way of utilizing maltodextrins directly. So if I put a maltodextrin, a complex of 2 to 3 to 17 glucoses on mammalian cells, they don't take it up. But bacteria are very good at staying alive. And in fact, maltodextrins are one of their primary energy sources. So bacteria will use anything, right? Bacteria, where they live on the food chain and in the world of evolution, right? They take up anything they can get. So yes, they can utilize glucose, et cetera, just like our cells can, but they also are very good at using multidextrins. And so they have this, um, they have several mechanisms, but I'm only gonna go into one of them. So in gram negatives, so remember in bacteria, you got an inner membrane, outer membrane, and a capsule. So gram negatives has that outer membrane. And they, in the outer membrane of gram negatives is this LAMB transporter. And so this is a very complicated transporter, and this is the 3D, this is the model from the, made from the crystal structure, and it has 18 of these beta uh, chains here that form a pore. So this is the outside of the cell here, of the bacteria, and this is the inside, and it very nicely forms, it looks like, I, all the interventionalists think, oh, it looks like a stent, right? Uh, uh, but it's basically a pore, and it has a little, these, these little, pieces of these loops stick on the outside and two of them or three of them fold in and form a little constriction. And so this is a transporter that brings maltodextrins into bacteria and it's a bacterial protein that's not expressed in any mammalian cell. 
and it's part of the ABC transporter family. So ABC transporters are ATP utilizing transporters, and they are the most primitive transporter. So they are in all eukaryotes, prokaryotes. Humans have you know, 60 or 80 of these ABC transporters, but it's a class of transporter, basically ATP, uh, that drives transport in a facilitated diffusion way. So again, the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, and it's also the binding site for bacterial phages, so bacterial viruses, that's where they bind. They bind to L9 right up here. And it's, the mechanism is facilitated diffusion because you have a concentration gradient from outside to inside because as soon as they get into the cell, the maltodextrins are broken up. And, it's, and, and this, is, you know, this is pretty risque stuff in the world of chemistry. It's promiscuous transporter. So this transporter, can, you can modify the maltodextrins and it'll sort of take anything that comes its way. So I'll show you a picture in a minute, but it really recognizes the first two or three glucose molecules. And then after that, you can modify things. And the transporter, as long as there's not a steric effect, as long as the molecule is not too big, it'll just suck it up through there as well. Now you say, well, this is gram negative, what about gram positives? And you're right. So on the, on, there's additional bonding sites on the inner membrane, and these are a family of genes called the mall genes, and I won't go into those too much. And these mall genes are also uh, maltodextrin transporters, and there's a family of them, and they're a little bit different between different bacteria, and they have different selectivity for different uh, maltodextrins, which opens up some interesting possibilities. But just think of this as a unique bacterial-specific mechanism that doesn't exist in mammalian cells. So our strategy then was, could we label a maltodextrin as an imaging tool, right, to directly image bacteria? Wouldn't it be great if we could see bacteria in the body? Um, uh, and again, the, the goal is here, mammalian cells don't take up this agent, agent but bacteria would. And note that this is also very different from what we use now. What do we use now? We use white cell scans and FDG. FDG measures metabolically active cells, so it measures neutrophils, macrophages, stuff like that, mostly neutrophils. And so when you do a white cell scan, you measure inflammation, not bacteria. So if you have a hip implant that's sore and causing pain, is it infected or does it just have inflammation there? If you have an arthritic knee, is it infected or is it inflammation? So a lot of our current technologies to measure white cell scans or FDG wouldn't discern between those two. And the idea here, would, could we have a bacterial method? And so, um, so this guy, Noreen Murthy, is one of the smartest people I know. Um, Noreen uh, used to be uh, here at uh, Georgia Tech. He's a chemist. He used to be in biomedical engineering. He's now at Berkeley as professor of biomedical engineering there. And Noreen is a fantastic chemist, and he figured out how to take a simple maltodextrin, this is maltohexose, so this is one sugar, two sugars, three, four, five, six sugars, see, that's one of the maltodextrins, and again, the receptor is going to recognize these first two, that lamb B is going to recognize these first two, and he worked out the chemistry to put F18 on the end of it, so this is a linker stuck on the end, and then F18, so an easy way to label this maltodextrin as a PET imaging agent. It's a pretty clever idea, and, and, and Noreen's a very clever chemistry, and this is very cool chemistry, click chemistry, that makes it work very efficiently. <clears throat> and, uh, and so Noreen came up with all of this, this approach to do this. And, um, and this is just shown the specificity. So this is E. coli. <clears throat> this is E. coli, and <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the uptake of this F18 labeled maltohexose. And it just shows that E. coli take up a whole lot. That's all you got to know. And that E. coli plus maltohexose put a lot of cold maltohexose. You can compete it away, suggesting a specific. <laughs> and then this lamb B is a lamb B mutant. Again, so this is E. coli in which that lamb B transporter is knocked out. They don't take it up. And then cultured hepatocytes don't take it up. So showing this very strong specificity for, <clears throat> for the bacteria and showing that it comes through this, multi, or at least data supporting that it comes through this multidextrin transporter, this LAMB transporter. It also shows the uptake time, this isn't E. coli, is very fast. So you put the stuff on, it equilibrates really fast, and it actually is in milli, micromolar to millimolar concentrations. So very high, very efficient uptake. <clears throat> so enter the next great collaborator, and that's Mark Goodman, who's here in radiology. And Mark is a PET chemist, so he's a, and he helped develop some of the PET chemistry and do some of the PET imaging. And so this is the, some of the first studies that were done in rats, and these aren't device infections. This is basically injecting a bunch of E. coli under the skin. So this is a PET scan of a rat. 
and you've injected, in this case, 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 5th colony forming units acutely under the skin of the rat. And then IV, you inject this, multi, this F18 labeled multohexose, and you can see it lights up this area of infection. This is a control area over here where saline. And this just looks at the ratio, so the region of interest uh, ratio. <clears throat> and again, showing that 10 to the 5th CFU is a very low colony count. Uh, for an infected device and showing that it can be t uh, detected by a PET scan. And again, this isn't a chronic infection, it's not a device, it's just sort of more like an abscess, sort of an abscess model. And it's acute. Um, <clears throat> they, we also showed in this first paper that you could, um, uh, that it was, you could use to monitor thera therapeutic efficacy. So we did the same thing and then treated those animals <clears throat> with ampicillin and using regular E. coli and you could knock down the, uh, uh, and they were injected on this side, you can knock down the infection and show that the infection was going away. This was a resistant strain of E. coli <clears throat> showing that you uh, couldn't knock it down. And then this is both of them. Notice the, race, the, the axis has changed here, basically wiped out using a different antibiotic agent. So basically, again, sort of proof of concept that you could monitor antibiotic efficacy uh, in terms of treating these abscesses. So enter the third smart person in this mix, and that's Kyoko Takayama, Takemiya. So Kyoko came to my lab initially as a uh, postdoc from Japan. Uh, she was actually on faculty there, came here to do some research, was interested originally in sort of cell therapies, but got interested in this area. And uh, uh, this, uh, Kyoko is now an assistant professor here in the Division of Cardiology, and most of the work I'm going to show you from now on is her work. Um, she, uh, for her initial work, uh, received the um, ACC Young Investigator Award uh, in basic science uh, several years ago, uh, won that. And then she recently had an American Heart Association Scientist Development Grant that she received a first percentile on that's funded her work now. And she's focused on using this in sort of medical device models and looking this, moving this towards a clinical utility. And using our friend here, this F18 multohexose, and that's the cyclic there, that, I mean, excuse me, the six uh, glucose is here, and then the F18 label, but also uh, Dr. Murthy's lab has been able to make fluorescent uh, labeled compounds. So again, this is the glucose here, the multidextrin, six glucoses. There's a linker here, and then this is a fluorescent dye. Um, this one has a number that's not important, but it's a near-infrared fluorescent dye. So near-infrared fluorescent dyes can have tissue penetration of up to a couple of centimeters, so you can see things in the surface, like around a pacemaker pocket, et cetera. <clears throat> so this is uh, some, some basic data with this. So these are cultured. These are meth-sensitive um, meth staph aureus grown in culture here. And then these are these E. coli that are missing this transporter, so they can't take up multidextrin. And she put the fluorescent... Um, uh, labeled compound on there. You can see and looked at it, you can image this in a fluorescent imaging system and you can see that the bacteria take them up very nicely and that these guys don't take them up. And importantly, when she labels them and then washes them and washes and washes, the dye stays in the bacteria. So the dye is not metabolized by the bacteria. In fact, we think it's probably cleaved off of the, off of the maltodextrin and the maltodextrin is used as an energy source but the dye then is retained. It's a very, the dye itself is basically very hydrophobic. And when you take a hydrophobic thing and click it on to multidextrin, it all becomes very hydrophilic. And so it can, it can uh, move around. But again, when it's clicked off, it's very hydrophobic, so it's not going to leave the cell and it'll be retained in. And you can see even through six hours here, it was retained in these bacteria. So you can do whole an animal imaging. So this is a device infection model. So what you do is you take a rat and under the skin, very much like a pacemaker, you clean the skin, use sterile septic, aseptic technique, you give them pre-procedure antibiotics, just like you would give a patient, and then we put a little bit of a surgical stainless steel under the skin. And there's a little dot here, which is a, basically a little photoshopped in square to show you how big it is and show you the approximate location. And then we can image that animal in a fluorescent imaging device. So here's a control animal that just has a device put in sterily, and you can see nothing. Uh, excuse me, I should say that then after three days, you inject the dye IV, and then you start imaging. And if you look at the bottom here, this is the group that has infection. You can see that you can see the infection here showing up very clearly. And this is a merged image, so this is a photo with the fluorescent image merged on top. <clears throat> 
What's interesting, this is a subclinical infection. So if you, if you draw the white cells on these animals, they don't have an elevated white count, they don't have a fever. They actually, the surgical site looks pretty benign. And the colony count is probably around 10 to the fifth CFUs total in this entire infected area. So this is a pretty subclinical early infection. And that was our goal, was to put a really high bar around this. Because um, we wanted to pick a very early stage infection that might be more mimicking the clinical situation. This middle group is interesting. In this group, um, we actually inject turpentine in there, and that causes a massive inflammation, as you might imagine, with all sorts of neutrophils pouring in, and that remains negative, so that stays clean. And then here's quantitation. I'll just look out here at 24 hours. Here's the control group, non-infectious inflammation. You don't pick that up, but this is the uh, and this is the intensity ratio. So you can see the infection group. So even 24 hours after you inject the dye, you can image this, but you can image it as soon as an hour. So we thought that was pretty interesting. And the fluorescent compound was useful to us sort of as a proof of concept, and we can do it faster than we can do the pet, com pet compounds and all, because that's a bigger deal because of the radioactivity and transporting down to the PET scanner and everything. But the fluorescent um, may also have some clinical utility in terms of surface infections. This is just the histology. So this is a control where the device is, and there's a few neutrophils around, not much. If you give turpentine, it's massive amount of inflammatory cells here. This is a gram stain, by the way. And then this is the staph showing gram-positive staining here in the infection site. So we also then use the, the uh, pet agent. And so this is a little rat that has an infection. And so here's the control group. You can see this. This is a non-infectious group, which is also negative. The arrow indicates where the device is. And then here's the infection group. And you can see this all lights up here, all this white all around here. It's shown best probably in the coronal view. So a very positive uh, PET scan um, for picking in this very sensitive fashion. You can see that we also pick up a, little, a lot of kidney here because it's excreted in the urine. And you pick up a little bit of liver, and that could be because the F-15 is being cleaved off. But mostly it goes into the, into the uh, kidneys and it's excreted in the urine. So high sensitivity here uh, in this area. This is FDG just for comparison. And you can see the difference here in the FDG and the non-infectious inflammatory group, the turpentine group. You can see the inflammation here. That's, that's a false positive, right? That's not bacterial infection, that's just inflammation. So that's one of the advantages of this, is we have a negative here with the, with the multohexose agent. I'll just finish up showing you one sort of evolving area. So what about endocarditis? Um, can you use this to look at endocarditis? Well, there's some real challenges there with PET imaging, um, because PET imaging has a long acquisition time. Right, so and particularly in a rodent, so rat's heart rate, 400 beats a minute. It's pretty hard to get things not moving around there, um, but uh, but there is possibility to use this for other sorts of infections. So this is a right heart, a model of right heart endocarditis or tricuspid endocarditis. Turns out uh, rodents don't tolerate uh, left-sided endocarditis very effectively. Their ejection fractions are like 95% and their heart beats 400 times a minute. So they don't tolerate much, regurgitant, uh, much of a regurgitant lesion before they die. So it's much easier to do right heart. So this is an animal that had a catheter uh, damage to the tricuspid valve and then received a staph aureus, a bolus of staph aureus. And then uh, after a few days um, uh, is given this fluorescent agent uh, IV. And then these are just the heart taken out and put in a cross section. So that's a cross section of the heart there. You can actually see the vegetations there on the tricuspid valve. This is the left ventricle, and that's the right ventricle over there. And that's the fluorescent images, and you can see that lights up there very specifically. And so, uh, you know, we don't have neurofluoride fluorescent probes now to look at the heart, but is this a possibility and something we could think about? Uh, because that's another dilemma we often end up with when we look at a, an uh, older, uh, more calcified or thickened uh, mitral or, or aortic valve, uh, discerning whether there's active infection there or just a scar with time. So can this be translated into humans? What's this mean? So are there bedside fluorescent imaging technology? There sure are. People use these in the operating room now for uh, uh, near infrared fluorescent imaging in the OR, uh, looking typically in cancer world, looking for uh, metastases. In this case, just using a nonspecific dye that looks at um, vascularity. So that could potentially be modified for a point of care bedside way of looking at near infrared. Again, the limitation near infrared, 
probably an inch or two is as deep as you can get through the skin, but could that be helpful with you know wounds or with a surface pocket infection, etc.? cetera? Uh, you could probably use some use there. Um, Esophageal near-infrared imaging does exist, so our GI colleagues now use near-infrared esophageal imaging in Barrett's and other things to look for uh, malignancy. Um, we've actually been in conversation with a company about modifying one of their probes to look in our animals to use a transesophageal near-infrared imaging to augment, uh, to image the mitral and tricuspid and the aortic valves to see if you could help us, help us identify uh, infections on those valves. And, and PET-CT has been used with 18FDG, uh, as we've talked about before. Here's a PET-CT showing infection at a device and at, a, at, a, um, uh, at, the, uh, at the implantation side of the, the, cat, the uh, wire as well as the device. Again, but there's issues with specificity there, which really, really limit the use and have, have prevented that from being useful in our daily care. So what's next? I'm going to finish up right now. Um, so our lead 18F imaging compound is close to being ready for use in a first in man study. We have all the toxicology studies are complete. We have to do some manufacturing design and controls and an IND application. And we have to raise several million dollars to make all that happen. Um, but we do think this is a promising way uh, to potentially image in bacterial infections. Um, the fluorescent agent, we further modified it to use good old ICG, Cardio Green, we used to use for measure cardiac output. We've modified it because it has a lower toxicity profile and considering moving forward with that. And we've developed a series of backup compounds uh, to look at things with longer serum stability and some other uh, potentially helpful um, characteristics. And, and then, you, then you start wondering, well, what else could you do with this? If you can deliver things so specifically bacteria, is this a, is this a targeting vector? Could you deliver, um, you know, suicide poison to bacteria very specifically and not only image but treat? So this whole area of theranostics, you could diagnose and treat at the same time. And, of course, additional imaging agents. We might ask about SPECT imaging agents. That's a possibility, too. The chemistry there is a little bit more challenging, but we're working on that right now. Um, MRI, probably not because of the spatial resolution and, and the need for the sensitivity issues are going to be a little challenging there, but I think either SPECT or, or PET um, would probably work. And so with that, I'm going to stop, take any questions you might have. Um, you know, again, thank uh, these three laboratories, and as I put the three individuals up there, but there are many people in their laboratories have been very helpful, and Lorraine has had a host of chemists who have worked on this have been very helpful. And, um, uh, Mark Goodman, Jonathan Nye, all the folks over in the Imaging Center have been really very helpful with all that. And then Kyoko, uh, who runs her own laboratory now, is focused on the fluorescent agents. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thanks. And I have to do all this myself. I'll turn on the chat thing so I can see if anybody's chatting. <laughs> Go ahead, Andy. Not a troll, just so you have to repeat it. But so, is, is the utility of this picking things up earlier that could be treated earlier and not have to explant the device? Um, or yeah, yeah. So, that's, I mean, that's one possibility. I mean, because <clears throat> honestly, by the time we pick it up in a clinical setting, it's usually too late, and you got a massive infection. So, could you revamp your entire approach to this? and maybe high-risk patients. So if you have patients that are on dialysis or have diabetes, would you screen those patients and at the first sign of a positive scan, would you then treat them uh, to prevent a more, uh, more advanced uh, infection that, has, that is clinically significant? So that's, that's one possibility. The other is in more in the diagnostic dilemmas. And then the third is post-treatment after you've taken all your hardware out and treated with antibiotics. When's the when's appropriate time to to either discontinue antibiotics or re-implant. So those are, those are sort of the three clinical settings. And again, that's just around cardiac devices. Think about this in terms of knees, you know, in orthopedic implants. Uh, you know, knowing the extent of the infection in a knee where you have a larger geographic area, you can get more spatial resolution, sort of a big deal. And whether they do a partial modification or, or take out the whole uh, implant is, is really important. And then again, you can think about someone with a hip that gets infected where you have to take out all the hardware, leave them without a functional hip for several weeks to months. If you could shorten that period of time, manage those patients more effectively, that could be helpful in that setting as well. Stan? Yeah. Uh, we do lab TVs, you know, for a piece of the time. 
Yeah, so, so how can we combine this with Echo? So, you know, we thought about this in a couple of ways. We, we actually thought about ways of generating micro bubbles and things like that, and that, that hadn't panned out too well. But the other would be to sort of combine it with a near-infrared uh, imaging uh, component on a TE probe. And the near-infrared imaging is, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, like I said, it's used by the GI folks now when they do endoscopies, mapping Barrett's, et cetera. The question is going to be is how much distance can we get, um, you know, and, and what kind of sensitivity you can get. On the surface, we can go about two centimeters, three centimeters. Inside where things are darker and there's less ambient light, you can probably go much deeper. And so I think the, the sort of the hope is and the thing we're exploring is combining this with a near-infrared sort of dual imaging modality. And again, with an, a fiber optic approach to that. Okay. Any other questions? Or? Okay. Well, uh, Spencer, you tell me and I'll repeat it. How about that? Uh, so near infrared is, is used to sort of image lipid and artery. I just wondered with a catheter based, if this endocarditis thing, I don't know what the distance is going to be. Yeah, so, so it would probably work in that setting. I mean, people are a little less excited about putting catheters in to measure endocarditis, to look at endocarditis, but that's certainly a, a, a possibility. The intervascular near-infrared imaging technology is pretty mature, actually. There's several companies, and, and, uh, and it's really focused mostly on trying to characterize plaque and plaque content, um, and the, it hasn't been used with a dye as, a, as an adjunct to it. And certainly this is a possibility. Um, you know, in terms of usability, I know you guys think putting a catheter in is no big deal, but um, that is a sort of a barrier then because it would have to be intervascular. But uh, conceivably, you could measure this, uh, you could image these as intervascular imaging. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. Oh, we got one more. Yeah, I have a question. So on the slide you showed, actually, you showed that there's a lot of, so there's a lot of colonization, like even in the healthy adults, there's Yeah. Yes. So the, you know, the question uh, for those who can't hear is, is, you know, what about colonization? So you have these patients that are asymptomatic that have these higher colony counts and, and, and PCR proven bacterial infection. How does that um, play out? And, and are we going to detect that? Are we going to have false positives that we would then treat people with antibiotics for nothing? Or, um, or are we actually then identifying people? And I think that's an unknown, right? I mean, we don't, and, you know, the sensitivity of this is to be determined in humans. I can tell you in rats what it is. You know, it's down to sort of 10 to the 4th CFUs, 10 to the 5th, sort of that level. Um, but that's a rat, and that's, that, that doesn't directly translate to humans. Um, I don't think we're going to get to the level that sort of this sort of indolent, uh, low level of infection that you see. Um, although it does penetrate biofilm very well. It's because it's hydrophilic. It goes through biofilms very well. So I, I think that's something to be, you know, sort of be worked out because there is a, a possibility of a false positive rate, if you will, or perhaps even picking up people at an early stage. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.